on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I find that people have a sort of an instinctive feeling that they can't work with data. If you strip out the jargon, that's really not true. People have a very instinctive visual grasp of what information can do for them. If you can just present it to them in a way that doesn't trigger their, oh, I'm doing math feelings. People can be making these great informed decisions about their books and their career. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson, from home again. Not in the office today. Yeah, and I've got to say straight away for people watching on YouTube, we are just coming to the end of our main lockdown, second lo lockdown third. in the UK. My third, is it third? I can't mm. keep count. My hair is out of control. Me I haven't too. shaved for weeks. Me too. It looks awful. It looks awful. I've got my old Boston hoodie on. But um, things will improve. I've I've emailed B, who cuts my hair, and I'm waiting to get into the list the long queue that they'll be out of lockdown to have your hair cut anyway. So just to apologise to people watching on YouTube. Um, but having said that, I am quite excited because if you are watching on YouTube, you can see Ooh. in my hands, this is a unique experience for me and I um, know it's a very common experience for you, Mark. I've spied a typo. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Um, I have already spotted a typo, actually. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've actually re-uploaded this to for those, KDP. For those who are, who are listening and not yes. watching, James is holding up a copy of The Final Flight by James Blatch, which is the uh, the book that has he's been writing for all of this podcast, all 270 whatever episodes, and then probably another five years on top of that. So he, is, he has it in his sweaty hand and it's almost ready to release. It is. I'm very, very excited about it. And... Um... Uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of people have helped me get to this point, but uh, there's a long acknowledgement at it the was end my, of the book. It was my pleasure. That. No, really, you don't need to thank me. It was a, it was a pleasure. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of you, actually. So lots of other people helped me. Um, yeah, so very exciting. So I have everything. I, I mean, everything is ready now, and I want to talk to you a little bit about this launch strategy because goodness knows we've talked about every other aspect of writing this book on this podcast, so now we need to, uh, to get over the finishing line with it. Um, I am inevitably tinkering a little bit. I've been really unhappy with the whole blurb process. Not not because I've, you know, people have told me it's not very good. Not that at all. It's just I've, I'm still to this day not really happy with it. And it's fine some now. of the other, yeah, okay. I, I mean, it's it, it is what it is. But anyway, it's um. I looked at actually a couple of. I might share them with you after this. A couple of ones I did a year or so ago, which actually looked tighter and better. Anyway, apart from the blurb, which is what it is, and may or may not be okay. Um, Everything's done. Uh, the KDP version is up. The print on demand version is up. On your advice, Mark, on the phone, the print on demand version is live. Yeah. And the KDP version has a release date at the moment of the 6th of May, although I can't see any particular reason for holding it that long now because it's all ready to go. In my mind, I thought I might enter the uh, Kindle Storyteller Award, which has to be published from May to August, but it has to be in KDP Select, and I've now published the POD version, so I think that's probably disqualified me already. So that's no, and I'm not going to win no, it that's got anyway. To do with it. Print, print it the POD version. Well, the the KDP Books version, KDP Print. Yeah, yeah. that has no, no no that doesn't disqualify it at all. What what they mean when it's in Select, it just means that you you can't be on Apple or you can't be on Kobo. You are completely fine to um, to be use use KDP to for the print version. That's that's not disqualifying. No, what I mean is I've probably published it oh. outside of the publication period. I see. I've published the POD version is now live, so I, I haven't published it between May and uh, August. So I think I probably I don't know whether the, the, the you'd have to check the. I, I suspect it hasn't actually. I I've, I think that probably means the ebook. Um, Okay. Either way, I'm not going to win that award, so that's not the point. The point is, <laughs> what do I do to maximise the release now of this? Um, I haven't. The only people who know the date are my social media followers on Twitter, which is not that many, really, twelve hundred or fifteen hundred something, like that. Um, and those only those who paid any attention to a couple of tweets. Uh, I think maybe I've adjusted the 
onboarding for my for new subscribers to my mailing list to to update it with that with that release date in it but i haven't broadcast emailed my list or which is only 550 at this stage um but presumably a, a reasonable number of those people will buy it so what to what what am i looking for presumably i'm looking for as much visibility as possible in those first seven days whatever it is yeah yeah so that there's the, we um kind of the slightly clumsy segue here is that we have a little mini course on launching that we released last week which we've nearly had almost a thousand people take it which is is kind of um is lovely it's about 800 and something i think it is at the moment um so that's not i mean and you've looked through that course it's one of it's a, like a mini cheap course it's yeah. about three hours worth of content with some downloadable kind of timesheets that, that i follow and some ads and some email copy that i use and i'm also going to be kind of live blogging the launch of the next milton book um, so I'll be posting as I do things. I'll be posting into a Facebook group, um, showing what I'm doing and the effect that it has. So yeah, for for you the, and and that's why this is dreadfully commercial. But you you can get that at uh, it's on the SPF um, resources course page. It's called Improve Your Launches, um, and it's about twenty dollars. So it's pretty pretty cheap for us. Um, but the the for you yeah the the, the main goal now is to try and increase the visibility as much as you can um so i'd be looking at you've got your pod up so you you could your advanced team can now leave reviews if you've got people you know obviously not related to you people who so i'm not going to do it um but people who um have read the book perhaps you know your advanced readers they can now leave reviews on the print version and those reviews will then appear on the ebook version when those two when both of the versions are live, Amazon will link those reviews and you'll get them on the ebook as well. Um, so that that's useful. Um, getting some reviews will help with conversion as you as you send traffic um, to the actual ebook page. But um, yeah, I mean, if you've decided that you don't want you don't want to wait till May, there isn't really any reason why you can't bring that um, pre order forwards now. And and I think if you were to say to Amazon, I'm ready to launch it now, it won't be launched today. It will be about four days, three to four days from now. So probably towards the end of the week. Um, what, one thing to think about, and it depends how many copies you think you might sell. And you, you might be surprised, you might sell more than you think that you will, because you've got, um, you know, 12,000 people will listen to this podcast on average. And there's 110,000, no, 100, 150,000 in the SPF uh, mailing list now, something along those lines. I should say nobody should feel obliged no, to buy my God, book. No. I've, and, I've benefited and, from your support all along this way, and that's absolutely. been great, so don't... Um... No one should feel obliged, but people are lovely generally, and, and I think you'll find a lot of people do buy it because they want to support you. Um, now, that does open up lots of interesting issues about also bought and things that is kind of not too much that we can do about do about that now i think because people are just going to buy it anyway which is very kind of them um but yeah you, you could the, the, the only thing to think about is whether you want to do it on a tuesday if you if you launch on a tuesday you maximize the chances of hitting the usa today bestseller list um okay and but then to do that it needs to it needs to be on more than just amazon so we, we you have to decide whether you want to do a kind of a um, an all platforms launch or a, a, a kindle only launch yeah, I mean, I would like to launch it wide, I think, um, and then put it into K- KDP Select. That was, that was my inclination, um, to do the audiences in that that order. Right, so I mean, one way you, you could look at it is you, can launch, you could launch it wide now. Right? So you, you could put it on all the other platforms through draft to digital or individually on each platform if you, know, if you wanted to, and you could release it that way for a week or, and, and, and kind of start directing traffic to it um up until the the day when you want to launch it then when you launch you if you want you could then take it down this is kind of what i do now is take it down from the wide platforms um and then launch it into select um and by doing that you'll maximize your amazon rank because you'll you'll get rank is calculated as far as we understand it by way of um a la carte sales so actual sales of the book from people who are not in ku and KU borrows. So if you if you click on a you know read now uh, in your Kindle unlimited subscription, that will effectively be equivalent to a sale. The, the actual page reads that's how you get paid, but it doesn't that doesn't affect the rank. Um, so by doing it that way, you'll 
if you launch that way, you'll get the benefit of KU reads. And I think you'll get quite a lot of KU borrows because a lot of people in the community, for example, as Scout runs past, um, <laughs> quite excited. He's very excited about my, my new advice series. He's, he's, mm. he's really mm. keen. Um, he agrees with that. He completely agrees. So y- you'll get you'll get people who in the in the community, lots of all of us, well, not all of us, but a lot of us will have KU subscriptions and you, you may find people will doubt, will borrow it um, almost immediately because it doesn't actually cost them anything to do that. Um, so if you wanted to get rank, I, I would suggest that you should be in KU the, when you launch. So you can kind of launch it wide on all the other platforms, take the book down when you've decided you've sold as many wide books as you think you're going to sell and then launch into KU. Okay, I understand that. And what is a strategy in terms of mailing list and advertising around that? Uh, well, you, you, I mean, your list is not very big, is it? I mean, how big? How big no. How, how many? For five sixty, knocking on six hundred. Okay. So, I mean, no, normally I'd say um, split that up a little bit. So you could do this. You could do two hundred on one day, two hundred on day two, two hundred on day three. And the reason we split it like that is because Amazon, again, largely speculation here, but educated speculation. Um, Amazon, the algorithm will seek to identify quick spikes and then it will decay those spikes quite quickly and it will, i think possibly in in uh after seeing you know book bub ads going out and and books going from twenty five thousand in the store to two or three um because they get thousands of downloads those the half-life on those sales is a lot um more aggressive than would be the case if you kind of just gradually ramp up sales with sustained sales over a period of days rather than a period of hours. So you could say, say you chose to launch next Tuesday, uh, you could launch, yeah. you could do 200 emails on Tuesday, 200 on Wednesday, 200 on Thursday, and and then kind of- And this spring- would be, sorry, this would be yeah. with the book wide, KDP, but not KDP select, not KU, No, I, I, and I, print on demand. I would- um, for your list, for it, I, I would, what I would do with your list is I, I would decide, first of all, decide what your strategy is. I, if you're going to do the, the what I've just laid out, you, you would, you, you'd set your pre-order in your, probably pencil it in just, just for say next Tuesday, email, put it, put it, put it wide as soon as you can. So this week, and then tell, tell your list, they now have the chance to I'm kind of making this up on the fly a little bit because it's a it's a so this is perhaps not exactly what I would do, but you, you tell your list that it's available on all platforms now and it's available to pre-order on Amazon now um, on for the ebook. So print is available yeah. now. All the other channels are available now. Uh, Amazon through ebook and Ku will be available next Tuesday, um, and then. Um, send those emails out probably i wouldn't segment them because there's probably not quite enough to make a big difference on on that score uh, then with with a plenty of time to make sure that those stores all come down and barnes and noble will, will be the one that is that is an irritating one because it's sometimes quite slow you want to make sure kobo and apple will be almost immediate barnes and noble sometimes quite slow so make sure you've got a bit of a buffer in there because what you don't want to do is set the um, pre-order for amazon to go live on tuesday and you still have the barnes and noble one live on tuesday because it hasn't come down yet um three days would be enough but probably but you know it, it can be unreliable and then um then so email them now tell them that it's available on all those platforms and then they can pre-order it and then email them on tuesday um and tell your tell them again that it's now available in kindle and on kindle unlimited and on Tuesday, I switch over. I close off the wide. No, you only have Amazon. You'll need oh. to close off the wide because Barnes and Noble can take three days. Oh, to, right. So you need to close that off. Right. I'd say Thursday. You don't have to launch on right. Tuesday. You could push it till say yeah, next yeah. next Thursday. You know, or, or week or, Tuesday or, to give me. Yeah, or the other way around is say tell people that it will be available very soon um, on Kindle, uh, and then it's available wide now then say at the end of this week, then delist it on all the stores. And as soon as it is down everywhere, then then tell Amazon, okay, now we're going to go with the, it's going to go into KU. You're going to bring the pre-order forwards officially and it will be three or four days when you make, since you make that decision, then it will go live on Amazon. Okay. Because Amazon is not immediate. If, if your pre-order is set into May and you tell Amazon you want to launch now, it won't be on that day. It will be two or three days 
away from that day. Okay. So put it wide. I can do that today. Yep. Email yep. my list. Yeah. Say it's wide. It's on pre-order in the UK and, uh, on Amazon. Although yep. the POD version is is available. Correct. Paperbacks are available on Amazon. Yep. And let that run. See what see what happens. At some point, decide. Okay, we're going to switch over to Amazon. Close mm -hmm. it off wide. Yep. Wait till everything is finally closed off. Yeah. So I don't break any rules, and then put it into KDP Select. So launch it and put it into KDP Select at the same time, and then it will bring the yeah bring the pre order forwards. So basically, tell Amazon you're yep. ready to sell it now, um, and then yep. and tick the box that says it's in KU, and then yep. as soon as that goes live, which as as I say will be, I've just I've just done this with the German book that's gone live today. As soon as it is live and you've got the email confirming it, then email again. Yeah. Okay. So if you're listening to this. I think what's probably going to be the case is it will be available wide next Tuesday, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, is that 13th? I think 13th. It's, the April. Sixth, it's Tuesday the 6th today, so it will be the 13th. Yeah, 13th. Which is the day after, it was my wife's birthday and the day after the pub's open in the UK. Well, there we go. We'll it's all be drunk. Uh, um, and then maybe a, a, a few days after that, uh, It'll be um, it'll go into KU probably the following Tuesday. Might be the way it works. Thinking about how this strategy people plans can, out, so it, people can all pre-order it now. Pre-order it, but not yeah. I mean, I've had I haven't told anyone it's on pre-order, and I haven't told I, the only people I've told literally are are close friends who've asked me about it and they wanted the paperback version, which sort of suited your strategy of putting that live now. So, so I've had half a dozen orders on the paperback, but I've had thirty pre-orders in a couple of days without telling anybody it's on there. But then people in the community have just been searching for it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. And and something I learned from your course, which I wasn't aware of, people might might well know this already, is that pre-orders count to rank as they are ordered, not on the day that they're fulfilled, which seems odd to me. Yeah, just on Amazon is different for the other platforms. So pre-orders on the other platforms effectively count twice. Um, so on, you'll get a rank boost when they're pre-ordered, and then they're counted again when the book goes live. Yeah, Amazon though, you, you, you'll that's why there's there's lots of different ways to launch, but they those pre-orders will affect your rank as they're pre-ordered, but they won't then count when you launch. So um, yeah, that's that's one of the main thinkings about the three different kinds of launches that I talk about in the course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The course, so you can go and check out the course, which I have been. I can I can thoroughly recommend as a new author uh, trying to launch his book. Uh, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash launches, uh, you can read all about it. And it's keenly priced at twenty bucks. There you go. Couple of cu couple of cups of coffee. Couple of very expensive artisan very cups expensive of coffee, ones, or yeah. four normal cups of coffee, five maybe. Um, good. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. And yeah, I'm joking aside. I have, there is a long acknowledgement in here because the community sort of helped me and quite a few professionals along the way have helped me. I'm enormously grateful for, um, for the help I've received, the encouragement and the occasional bullying, uh, along the way, uh, to get to this point. I, you know, I'm late to this party. I think for most people listening to this podcast will have published books in the past and held this copy in their hand. But um, for those of you who are still yet to do it, I can tell you it is a fantastic feeling to, um, at this stage. I'm very proud of, of, of the work that we've that I've put in and others have put in with me to get to this point. And I'm excited to move on to book two, Redneck, which is the working title at the moment, which I think will probably work. I've spoken to Stuart about it. I think if we can do the old hammer and sickle on the R for Red... There's a long line of thrillers with red something um, that are set in the Cold War, so I think that's going to work as well. So, I'm I'm I'm, I'm on the runway, Mark. To, to carry on with the flying analogy, I'm on the runway. About... Doesn't the plane in your in your book crash? <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers, please. Um, yeah, and the uh, the front of the podcast. I think we did think about this, so it can stay as it is for now. We don't need to get Huey back in. I still am a first time author. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what it says now, but no, I think you, you need to sell a few before we decide to change it. Yeah. How are you going to cope when I get nominated for the Booker and the Whitbread well, and the Costa? You know, and... It was, we hate it when our friends become famous. Oops, they're not my microphone oh over. Oh, my God. That's um, how angry he is. He's just pushed his microphone over. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm, it's great. I want to see uh, you sell as many as possible. And then... Um, Thank you. Yeah. No, I think it's uh, it's it's exciting. 
Good. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much indeed, Mark. Uh, you do get a mention in the acknowledgements. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, let's move on to today's interview. I think we've talked about what we need to do. I suppose we should just say oh. that the 101 course is still available. <laughs> There's still it's until next Wednesday, as uh, the 14th. That'll be that'll be the last day for signing up to Self Publishing 101. This is the course that I took uh, as well as well as helping Mark put together to enable me to get to where I am now. So if you look at JamesBlatch.com and my Twitter account, and uh, if you're lucky enough to be served a Facebook ad from me, this is all the early found foundational oh, stuff. Those Facebook ads are really good, but I mentioned this. I said you were texting that the other day, but I saw one of your you ads did, in yeah. my feed, and the image is great. I don't know who is that. Stuart did that. That is Stuart. Uh, well, that was taken by John Weston um, with me actually oh. in my helmet. And then that was turned into that striking right. image by it's Stuart It's a really Beish. good ad, yeah. And I, I would be very yeah. tempted to buy based on that. It's it's really good. So that's well, I think that must be where the pre-orders are coming from because that's all I'm doing no, is running no. those. I, so, as you said, I think some of them might yeah. be. It's hard to say because you can't track pre-orders with with um, no. any kind of tracking. But um, I, I, some of it will be. But I think a lot will, will be lovely people in the community who are just looking for your book um, and 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 buying it. Okay. So combination of the two, I think. Good. I have to start thinking about the audiobook. I did a little test record this morning to see whether I think I might want to voice it or not. Not sure. The trouble mm. is, I don't like the sound of my own voice. So when I listen back to it, I no, think I'll get professional I, in. I wouldn't. Um, I think you'll have more fun with a professional. Hmm. Probably. People do like authors reading their own books, so I think there is something they, to it. Some I think people... non fiction, I think, is fine. Um, I think that's probably mm. best, um, unless you've got a voice like Neil Gaiman, who, who's who's a, who's you know he's quite talented, has a nice voice, and Oh, yeah, thanks. Steve, what you're saying? I don't think you're as talented as Neil Gaiman. I, I think, yeah. Well, there's there's broadcast. I don't think people want Alan Partridge reading a book about the Cold War. Well, some people oh, might. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think I think you'll have much more fun doing the process properly and finding a narrator yeah. um, and and going through it. You'll learn more as well, which is good for everybody because then you know we can do a podcast about okay. that experience. Okay, but well, we need to move on to the interview well, because we're running out of quite. recording time. Not quite. Oh, Before on. we do that, um, well, you've forgotten Patreon, so I'll do it. Um, oh, right. yes. Two, thank you. Thank you very much to two Patreon subscribers. And I, I don't have any problems with the names today. We've got Gordon Murphy from Cowden in the UK and Stephen Crabb. So thank you very much for supporting us on Patreon. It does. We're very grateful. It makes it um, a lot easier for us to, to you know, continue putting the podcast out when we've got lots of very kind authors supporting us. So we thank you very much once again. Thank you. I know you chose it when we have two very easy to read out names and I <laughs> I have those other weeks. Uh, we love every Patreon supporter though. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, look, um, let's move on to the interview, which I keep uh, teasing up. So there are a few dashboards available for you to help you interpret on a daily basis and monthly and yearly basis, your KDP and other data, data from Kobo, et cetera, bring it all into one place. It can be time consuming. People have different ways of doing it. Well, there's a new kid on the block and it's called Scribe Count and does all those things and a little bit more. It's done uh, by authors for authors, launching as we speak, I think it's launching actually this week. Uh, so a good time for us to feature the interview. This is uh, Philippa Werner from ScribeCount, and then Mark and I will be back for chat off the back. This is the Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Philippa, welcome to the Self-Publishing Show. Lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much. Where Great are to you? be here. It looks like you're joining us from deep space, but uh, <laughs> where more specifically are you joining us from? Uh, the frozen wastes of Minnesota. Uh, ah, so it's okay. quite snowy and brown outside right now, actually. Wow. But America's such a vast country because some people are bathing <laughs> in sunshine, aren't they, this time of year? And you've still got the snow yeah. on the ground. Some of our teams in Kentucky, uh, Ohio, Florida. And so then there's there's me. <laughs> yes, still the summer is coming. Spring is around the corner. OK. Yes. Look, Philippa, we're going to talk about Scribe Count, but I would like to talk a little bit about you first, if that's all right. I want to find out a bit about your author history, where you are with your own writing, because we're all sure, interested yeah. as, as writers. <laughs> so let's start with you. I think it's a sci-fi. You look like you're yes. in a sci-fi set if yeah. you're watching on YouTube. So there you go. That's what it is. Sci-fi and fantasy. Yeah. Oh, fantasy. Um, so I started off with in 2012 with fantasy and uh 2013 was uh my first big series that was light and shadow and it's uh young adult fantasy it's about a young woman who gets she's an orphan she gets taken from her family and becomes a bodyguard for a noble woman okay who 
uh, she and the noble one absolutely despise each other. So. <laughs> and what sort of realm universe is that set in? It was, it's a fantasy, historical fantasy setting. It was based politically on the War of the Roses. Okay. Um, so that would be familiar to a lot of fantasy readers because yes. Game of Thrones was also based on that. But um, it is a, a great deal less uh, brutal and graphic than <laughs> than that. And um, George R. R. Martin's and the actual War of the Roses, which were fairly brutal. So Yes. But there was a bit yes. of romance going on on the sidelines, I'm sure. Uh, yes, there is. There is a romance. And then mostly it's actually centered on the eventual friendship between the two women. Okay. Um, and since then, I've moved on. I've been doing uh, more fantasy work. I'm working on an epic fantasy series right now that will come out next year. Um, and I'm also working on some sci-fi stuff. Uh, I was working with Michael Anderley in the Cotherian Gambit series. And under that pen name, which is Natalie Gray, I'm doing a Space Marine series right now. So. Okay, Space Marines. So you separate out the pen names because you don't feel there's an overlap between sci-fi and fantasy, or is that because you were working specifically with, with the Anderley project? Uh, part of it was because I was working with the Anderley universe, and uh, part of it was that it, there was sort of a difference. Uh, a lot of the sci-fi and fantasy that I was doing under the Moira Katzen pen name is... A, a different quality. There's a lot more sort of political wrangling, not like politics as in interspersed with today's politics, but in terms of court intrigue and mystery. And then uh, the things that I do under the Natalie Gray pen name tend to be snappier, a lot more sarcastic, a lot more. <laughs> That's interesting, is it? There's yeah. so It's so important not to confound the expectations of readers, isn't it? If you have a cover yes. that doesn't match what's going to be on the inside or a blurb or or indeed you're selling to a list of authors for one genre, something that they're yes. not expecting or enjoying. It's just going to backfire, isn't it? Yes. And it's difficult, honestly, to separate out what those things are going to be um, because a lot of my work seems very similar to me, despite being, you know, sci-fi or fantasy and then trying to segment your reader list and say, okay, are you just interested in fantasy? Or are you just interested in sci-fi which of my works do you like and trying to segment people in and yes. say, okay, how can I give you more of what you were looking for yeah. and not bother you with, because everyone's inbox is so full all the time. Yeah. You don't want to be sending emails that people don't like. No, so. but you have a mailing list. Yes. And you yes. use that. I suppose you can always just explain to people once. Look, I also, <laughs> do they, your, do your mailing list know who you are? They know you write as another. Yes. Um, and right now I'm in the middle of a rebrand on my, website so that people can easily see okay these are the same person um and you know putting a flow chart quiz in there about okay what do you, what do you want to read next oh, what okay sounds interesting to you and then they can cross over but a lot of things that i will send to both of them and so, how, how many books have you written now oh lord um i want to say it's up past 40 wow. at this point considering ghostwriting and my own writing so wow and when you wrote my last questions on your writer career, when you write uh, with Michael in his universe, how does that work or how has it worked for you? Uh, so the first thing was obviously for me to read through all of the work um, and then talk with him and talk with some of his readers because he has a, a group of beta readers and just say, okay, here's what we've been wanting to know because the Carthurian Gambit is such a rich universe that there are plenty of places that could be expanded or plenty of pieces of backstory that he wrote for himself as plot lines um, and then could be expanded from there. And so there were a couple of side characters whose stories I wrote and side adventures I wrote that had been hinted at or sort of sideways mentioned in the main story, but it was, oh, you know, last month, Stephen and Jennifer were off doing X, Y, Z, and then I can actually bring that to life. And and show what was happening in the background. And that's really fun. Yeah. Uh, his beta readers are passionate. And so among other things, it, you can get a sense of the emotions underlying that world and really get the sort of feedback you only dream about as an author. That's, here's what I love. Here's my own uh, head canon. Here's what I've been thinking about this character. and 
it's just great to have that that very live, very dynamic feedback going on. Yeah. So. Well, what fun for the fans as well, because, yeah. you know, if I could write to George Lucas or, you know, yeah. the alien Ridley Scott and explain what I'd like to see in the next alien film <laughs> and have a conversation and see that come out, that would be awesome. But um, so it's a great experience yeah, for the fans. It is. I think that's one of the great things about self-publishing mm. too, is that there is that that responsiveness. And it's something that sometimes works for me in series and sometimes doesn't. So for instance, the fantasy series I'm writing right now, I'm actually drafting all of it before any of the books come out. Right. So that I can not have the the feeling of like, oh, well, if I go in this one direction, that might really disappoint people or um you know, sometimes you really want to work with the fans that way. And sometimes you think, oh, wow, this will be really paralyzing. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can imagine that. And ultimately, you've got to write something that you want to write as well, that you can't, if you really don't like the idea of it. Um, you've got to be your own person. I'm in the middle of trying to get my my book done. I'm getting so much advice that I am at that point now where I realize I have to do what I think is the right thing, ultimately, however many conversations you have with people. Yeah. Yeah. I like to, I think it was Neil Gaiman who said, whenever someone tells you that something in a book isn't working, they're almost always correct. And whatever they tell you how to fix it, they're almost always wrong. Uh, good. And so I try good to keep Neil that Gaiman in mind. Quote. We must get Neil Gaiman on this show. He's going to be great to talk to. Yes. Um, okay. Right. Let's, should we move on to scribe count then? So mm-hmm. you better explain what scribe count is and what problem it solves. <laughs> Yes. So scribe count provides dynamic reporting. The idea behind it is that you can log into your computer in the morning, you bring up scribe count, you know exactly what's working and what's not in your writing, you know, it's selling and what's not. Um, and so if you're in Kindle unlimited, for instance, and you're just exclusive to Amazon, you can be seeing the split between, uh, page reads and eBooks sold, uh, soon there will be audio and print as well. Um, and if you're uh, wide distributed, you can log in and see, oh, wow, you know, draft to digital had this huge jump the other day. Let's dig down and see, was that Tolino? Was that Viflio? Um, or, wow, you know, Barnes and Noble has this huge new chunk here and what series is selling there. And then once you have that snapshot, you can also be looking in uh, and see, you can tag things differently. So one of the things I do is I have my books tagged by subgenre, And so I can look in and see, okay, is uh, epic fantasy selling more for me than urban fantasy right now? Has there been a surge there? Are different series or genres selling better at different retailers? Things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So... So how it works from a user point of view, how do you get, how do you link it up in the first place to your various accounts? Ah. Okay. So uh, this is actually one of the the super interesting parts of Scribe Count. Uh, Randall and I ended up handing our developers a fairly impossible brief. We said, we want you to be able to get the data from these six major ebook platforms without having any of the user information, uh, cookies, uh, session IDs, any of that. We'd like them to be able to delete their data at any time so that they know we're not storing it, which is big for a lot of authors. Um, And so essentially what it is, is there, uh, when you go to enable it, and if you're watching me and I'm looking off to the side, it's because I'm staring at my account screen. So what it is, is there are basically six doors. There's one that goes to Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo. Um, And you can enable those if you want to. Once you've enabled it, you tell them, you click a link that says go to login. And so that basically teaches your scribe count the path to iTunes books or Google Play bookstore. And it works with the fact that you're already logged in on your computer. So every 15 minutes, it will just send a request over to Kobo or Google and say, hey, is there any new data? And Kobo or Google will say either yes or no, the user's logged out, the store is closed. So it can't open any doors on its own. It can't keep any doors open. It just works if you are logged in. And so most mornings I actually have to log into Apple again. Apple has one of the more stringent 
security measures of any of the platforms um, and usually Kobo. Um, and so I'll, I'll log into those and then it syncs and uploads the data that came in overnight because it can't see that when the computer's off. Uh, it doesn't have any data streams coming in. And then I go back to my dashboard and I can see what my, my uh, distribution is for the month. And one of the things we're working on is making sure that the dashboard will be much more customizable. So if you've got, for instance, a book bub on one particular series for the week, you could set it for that week as, okay, I just want to see this series and I just want to see it for the past few days. Okay. In terms of what it presents to you when you, uh, you glance yep. at it. Um, so if you have, presumably if you have multiple accounts, that would be a problem if I had more than one KDP account or... Yes. Uh, for now, yes. So the way we're handling it right now is we would recommend uh, two things. First of all, that you email us and say, hey, I have two accounts. And that way we can comp one of them and make sure you're not paying twice. Um, but the other thing is that we would want you to run them out of different browsers so that it could pull in those two streams of information. And in the future, we will be looking at making two KDP accounts work on the same Stripe okay. account login. It'll recognize. So that will be something that happens. It's obviously because of the way Scribe count works with the active login, it's a little bit of a, um, how do you make that work all yeah. at the same time? Are you archiving data? Is that consistent with our data practices? That sort of thing. Sure. There are a few dashboards around for people. What's, <laughs> what's the USP? What's the differentiator for Scribe count? Uh, Scribecount has uh, six of the major platforms. So that is far and away the biggest thing right now. We're also looking at a lot more analytics that people can shift and look at very easily. So you can have your royalty payout and you can download that and just forward it to your accountant. You'll be able to manually add income. So if you're getting income from Payhip or Patreon, um, one of our big updates that come that's coming is an interactive calendar. So you can add promotions and their costs. You can add um, dates when things are going into or coming out of Kindle Unlimited, dates that you need to have your pre-orders uploaded, things like that. Because, um, I mean, we've all whiffed on a pre-order date, right? <laughs> I've only got one, on but I hope I'm not going to miss it. But, uh, I shouldn't do. Good luck. Good luck. Thank Everything. you. Knock on wood. Um, so that calendar feature will be tracking ads. It'll be tracking promotions and expenses. Uh, and you'll be able to see your data going day by day compared to what you're, you're promoting, what you're putting out there in terms of marketing. And you can see, oh, wow, I spent, you know, $400 on this one uh, series. And there is no spike coming after that. Okay, but there's this other series that is having a huge spike and I haven't spent anything on it. Should I try to ride that wave and get a couple of newsletters going? Things like that. So it's really the amount of data and the help in filtering it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's part of why I was brought on board is I'm a data person. It's what I was majoring in. It's what I've worked in. And I find that people have a sort of an instinctive feeling that they can't work with data. And if you strip out the jargon, that's really not true. People have a very instinctive visual grasp of what information can do for them. And so if you can just present it to them in a way that doesn't trigger their, oh, I'm doing math feelings. Yeah. You know, it, people can be making these great informed decisions about their books and their career and all of that. Yeah. So it sounds like it's very author centric, indie author centric, geared oh, around absolutely. the way that we run our businesses and what we need to know, uh, which is obviously a very positive thing. So where did this all come from, and when when have you joined it, Philip? Because you you weren't there at the beginning, or were you? Um, I was not the original uh, person behind it. That's Randall Wood. He's our our CEO, and then he brought uh, me and Sarish on as co-founders. Sarish Finkanapathy is our lead developer. Um, He's off in Kentucky, Randall's in Florida, here in Minnesota. And then the rest of our development team is scattered worldwide. Okay. Um, and so between the three of us, we 
got things underway, Sarish um, has a background in software as a service, uh, SaaS uh, programming. And then Randall and I are authors. And so for Randall and myself, it was we wanted to use this. We were spending so much of our time trying to collate our data, trying to come up with good directions to go in. And part of it is it's not just the time, right? Because if you're trying to figure out which direction to go, where to promote, uh, where not to promote, whether you should be in KU or you shouldn't, you're downloading all of these reports, you're trying to put them together but it's also a really error prone process. So it's so easy to put something in the wrong column and all of a sudden you're working with the wrong data and just having something that you can look at very quickly and you don't have to add things up and you don't have to sum and you don't, none of that. Um, and so to have a computer do the things that computers are best at uh, so that you can do the things you're best at that was something that Randall and I wanted to do. And then for Sarish, it was um, one part really great challenge. And then one part, um, Philippa and Randall keep sending me things like you can't use session IDs. And now I would like to stab the two of them. So, you know, yes. you win some, you lose some. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that being a really, that's yeah. how you want to do it. I mean, it's very convenient. <laughs> it makes it nice and easy and it stops that faff at the beginning where I imagine is a pain point for a lot of these dashboards is they fall over in that first 10 minutes when the author gives up trying to connect it or get it going. Yes. So, that's yeah. the thing is, you know, we wanted it to be very intuitive to use so that you could log into it and say, you know, in five minutes I'm up and running and my data are coming in. Um, obviously if you have a huge backlist or all of your data are, you know, back to 2012, yeah. it's going to take a few updates for all of the information to come in, but, um, you should be able to get through setup in two to five minutes. Yeah. And how's it going? I mean, when, when, what stage are you at in the development? Is this, this is gone beyond beta now? Is this? Yes. Uh, so, so we're recording this on March 29th and April 1st is the end of the beta phase. Oh, okay. So um, one of the things that happened was we did a soft launch. Um, no matter how much beta testing you do, as soon as you release something into the wild, you'll see people that are using software differently than you would intend to. You'll also see people with different browser configurations mm. and bugs will pop up that you wouldn't have known about. Um, so we're finishing up with that live beta period, getting all of the wrinkles smoothed out. And what we'll be doing next is we'll be starting to add more platforms. So Smashwords is far and away the largest, um, number of requests that we have. Right. And then, uh, Ingram Spark after that, we have a lot for audio. Yes. Um, cool. and things are kind of tied after that. There's a lot of pay hip or uh, Patreon, uh, different things. But there are so, so many of the different uh, platforms. And that presents its own issues as how do we make it easy for you to log in and see if you have 48 platforms yeah. instead of six, how is it easy to check? Um, and so that's part graphics, it's part programming. And each of the different uh, platforms regularly throws a wrench into the works. Mm. Uh, for instance, right after we launched in mid-January, Amazon decided to change how it stored pre-2016 data. And so suddenly we had people that weren't able to get any of that. Not everyone, just some people. Or, you know, Google changed uh, when and how it updated daily data and and so, and that happens regularly. And so that's why this isn't something that's just one and done is every platform is optimizing all the time yeah. because it really is optimizing. It's not just changing for the sake of changing. They're trying to make things more useful for yes. others. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's just for those of us who do online courses and software that interacts, it can be <laughs> frustrating experience. Yeah. When Jeff, or used to be Jeff, wakes up in the morning and says, I think we're going to do things differently today. Um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, it is improvement generally. Uh, okay. So uh, before, whilst it's in my mind, um, how much does this cost? Ah, yes. So there are four tiers. If you're making combined up to $500 a month, you are not paying at all for ScribeCount. 
and then um between there uh it's between 15 and 25 dollars so 15 between 500 and a thousand a thousand to five thousand i believe is uh twenty dollars a month and then five thousand up is 25 okay and that was important to us be so each tier gets all of the features um you're not paying any more for different features uh but we were tiny baby authors at one point and we want to help people grow beyond that baby stage if that's what they want but also we know that when you're just dipping your toe in this this isn't something you can necessarily pay for and so you know we want to give people that chance um to get an idea of what's going on with their data and work with it and then also because we found the indie community to be so welcoming so pay it forward you know it, you are in a sense uh helping out other authors if you're one of the larger ones paying at scribe count yes because you're helping that stay afloat so that baby authors can come on board yeah great um and in terms of you you present the data can you also download in in various yes. configurations because people do like to have i mean i certainly somebody likes to work with a spreadsheet Oh yeah, absolutely. And so you are able to download uh, there and then we'll be uh, debuting and working with different um, different pre-made analyses. So we'll say to people, you know, um, we think this might be useful to you, let me know. And if it keeps being something that people want, you can select, you know, I'd like this particular analysis, this for instance, velocity analysis of a series or, this sell through of a particular series and we'll add that to the pre-mates. Yeah. And what, so, are, what are the complicating factors of downloading the data individually is dealing with exchange rates, I think. Yeah. Yes. I mean, um, and so that is, um, that brings up two actually very interesting things is that we have people uh, emailing us and saying, uh, you know, I want you to know that your, your numbers are slightly off. Say so, okay. Um, can you give us any details? And they say, well, for uh, the month of February or the month of March, um, it, it's showing different numbers than Book Report or Publish Drive. We say, okay. Well, um, thank you. Those numbers aren't set yet. Those payments aren't set in an exchange rate yet, which means that all of us are guessing about what that exchange rate is going to be, um, and each one of the sales aggregators has its own methodology for that. So we use um, the daily exchange rates. So we use yesterday's exchange rates from okay. um, into whatever you've set your default currency as. And um, different places may use different ones. I don't know how each other place does that. Yeah. I, I I think that's a good. I think that's a good solution, I and mean, I generally do more or less the same thing on on my spreadsheets. As I look at xe.com and the market rate for that day, you're right. It's guesswork, but unless there's a horrible crash of somebody's currency, it's not yeah. going to make a massive difference. It's going to make a hundred pounds in five thousand over a month or so. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a small thing, and so usually we'll have people calling in and saying, you know, I've got this. A sixteen dollar difference. I've got yeah. you know something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all guesswork until the payments are set and out. So yes, on a related note, I quite like the, the dollar to get stronger. Seems to be in a bit of doldrums <laughs> recently. So if you could boost that, it would be great. I'm not sure how, uh, how much well, influence you and Randall you know. have, but <laughs> but get that one up. Okay, so how's it going? You've had your your, your beta. You're on the cusp of the of the main launch, and yes. you're feeling feeling it's in a good place at the moment. Yes, um, it's, it, I'm trying to sort of gather my thoughts because in a lot of ways it's been very emotional, uh, honestly. Um, and part of that is on a personal level, you know, Randall brought me on board last year and it was, oh my God, this is such a great idea and this is so great. And then there's actually the moment that you log in in the morning and you see a sudden chunk of pink, You're like, oh, something happened on Kobo. And I know that immediately. Mm. And I can look at what that was and I can, wow, this is actually doing all of the things that I wanted it to do. And then there's also, you know, seeing the preliminary feedback and having people write to you and just say, you know, you get an email that's all in caps 
and that's how you start your morning that says, I feel like I just got a puppy. <laughs> it's like, it, it's so nice to be able to see that and to be able to work with people who are saying, you know, I'd love you to be able to do this. I'd love you to be able to do that. Like, okay. I literally never would have thought of that. And so it's, it's been tiring. There's been a lot more coffee than I think my stomach and blood pressure uh, appreciate. And it's been very difficult at times trying to find ways around software constraints and all of that, but it feels so exciting um, and almost enough adrenaline that you don't need any coffee. <laughs> yes. I think we are authors. We are driven on coffee. I'm probably the same as mm. you and have a little bit too much than everything's uh, uh, the body's set up for. Okay. Well, look, we can find you, I think, at scribecount.com. Is that correct? Yes. And I'm looking at that nice, nice looking website. Oh, look at that. Yeah, very nice. We do like a nice <laughs> website. And uh, I'm always going to do my scaling test. Oh, yeah, it scales for mobile very nicely as well. Excellent. Okay, so Friend. people can go along there and sign up for free. So out of interest, if somebody's doing 10,000 a month, but yes. they want to have a dip in and see what it's like and, and use the free service for a bit just to see what what happens yep. as a result of that. Does it cap the figures at 500 or? Oh, no, no, no. Um, so they'll see all of their data. They'll get the two-week free trial. Oh, okay. There's and a two-week free trial. I guess I missed yep. that. You did probably say that, but yes. Uh, okay. I uh, I may completely have whiffed on that. Uh, so there's two weeks free. Um, and then the because some people can dip in and out of different tiers, the amount that you pay is based on your prior month. Okay. And we will be looking at annual subscriptions, but that will depend somewhat on what ends up being a good deal. You know, if someone tends to be rotating right around that 1,000 to um, 2,000 number, then what is a good deal for them if they're prepaying for a year? Yeah. Um, Cause we don't want to, you know, charge them 18 a month if half the months they would have been at 15 anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So once we have more date, more annual usage data, we'll know. The problems of the people who, good... who bumble around on the borders are going to be uh, difficult for you, but everyone else, I suppose, you know, generally the, the pricing structure is geared around going up and being more successful and therefore it's an economy of scale, isn't it? So it's not, yes, it's not too uh, but we definitely do want it to be one of those things where you, um, you think, Oh, wow, I've, I've now I have to pay, but that's because I make more money. Yes, so. <laughs> exactly. Great. Well, I'm quite excited to download it. I mean, my life is complicated because I run Fuse books. I run SPF books. I run James Blatch books now. And so I do have multiple accounts all over the place. So it's going to be complicated, but I will definitely have a look at it and check it out. I'd advise, I'd urge uh, our listeners also to have a go and check it out. And uh, see, I'm sure we'll see some discussion about it in our various Absolutely. Facebook groups. And you've got, what are your plans for marketing? I mean, here you are on our podcast, obviously the number one podcast in the self-publishing circle, but uh, you must have some other plans uh, for marketing. Yes. Uh, so there's definitely... Um, we'll be trying to do a long-term organic structure, just bringing in other authors and looking at all sorts of aspects of publishing success. One of the things that we're ta tackling very much this year is what does publishing success look like? And so bringing in authors who have very different careers, um, some who are still doing day jobs because they want to be doing day jobs and their writing is either uh, connected to that somehow, or it's, just totally different. And mm. what does that look like for them versus people who have set up an entire business or all sorts of things. And so that will be reaching people. And we hope to be part of that discussion, partly because we want scribe count to be that data source that lets you figure out what your success looks like. Yes. Because we know that will be different for everyone. Uh, but also we will be going on podcasts, we'll be talking to authors. And one of the things that we want is to be in the communities where people are discussing this because there is so much just easy little questions where people say, oh man, you know, I'm clicking through the sunburst graphic and it's just so annoying to have to click all the way back out. And just imagine having someone there who says, oh, there's the little reset button in the upper right hand corner. And so you can just one click and go back to the whole sunburst, things like that, that just make it easier to use having responsive 
uh, yes. customer service there. And then people can, you know, interface with us directly to say, oh, hey, you know, smash words, please, or whatever platform it is that they want, whatever features they want. Yeah. I think so definitely being that, embedded. That is very important. And there's no no reason not to in this day and age to have your own little forums where people can, you know, typically it would be a Facebook group, I guess. Mm. Uh, to ask the horse's mouth, so get the uh, <laughs> the word from the street. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm very um, full of admiration. I know from our own experience in SPF, the work that goes in, we've just launched Hello Books, and that was a year and a half of doing something every day for it to the point of launching, uh, and then the work starts. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, when it launches. So, I, you know, I do know what it's like, and so I want to say congratulations. And where we're sitting now, yeah. at least, good luck. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's, yeah, it's been, as you say, and now the work starts. Yeah. Um, yeah. In many ways, it's a new phase, that's for sure. Good. Okay. Well, look, um, it should be live by the time this goes out. It'll probably be a couple of weeks from now. So mid April, I imagine. And um, yes. it'll be ready for people. Yes. Ready and adding new features all the time. So. We can't wait to be uh, to be piling those on. The calendar feature especially is one that I'm very excited about. So, Superb. Philippa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, James. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. So they've been in touch with us. And um, yeah, so there's book report which people use. There's John Logston's uh, reader links and... Uh, what are the other ones? That are there's that? a few. I mustn't miss. There's a few. I mustn't miss any. I mean, of course, if you're using, um, you know, draft to digital and publish drive, you get a certain amount of, of data there as well. Uh, and then there's Excel, which I have to say I'm a bit of a fan of. I sort of use the process of of logging down. I mean, I'm exclusive with the two series we market. Um, it makes it a bit easier, but of, of logging that information, I kind of use the process of filling in an Excel spreadsheet that I've designed to help me keep an eye on the data and analyze it because every time I do that I think oh, I've got to I've got to optimize these campaigns I've got to refresh these campaigns um I prefer it that way but I will certainly have a look at scribe count now, you're you're a book report person I think Mark are you? I am yep I'm, I remember when I started doing this and I'm, I was like you I, I like spreadsheets I like spreadsheets in Excel too and I, I did um all of the stores every every night and it, at the start of things when I had a few books it might take 10 minutes and you know not many sales and not many books it didn't take long but it got to the point where it was taking me 45 minutes every night to do it. And I was, it was starting to get a little silly. Um, and so I stopped doing the spreadsheet. Then I did it weekly. Now I do it monthly. Um, so actually, I, I, the, the monthly one is just, I kind of do a daily, any money going out, I think is in some ways is better. You need to keep a more closer eye on the, than money coming in. Um, so I'll do kind of an ad check once every three or four days at the moment. And then I'll make sure I have kind of a monthly overview. The the actual kind of um, income I just use book report and the KDP um, uh, dashboard these days. It's obviously, a lot easier now that I'm just just with Amazon. Um, but I think it is useful when you're starting out to to have really be on top of your numbers and to know and to be able to get a sense of what promotions are working in in a way that's easier to decode than if you did it six weeks later. Um, you know, and you, you, you've been doing it that way for a while now. And it, it, it is, it's, it's also, I mean, it's, I think it's a bit spotty to use a kind of a word, word from the eighties, but I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that I am a bit of a data spot when it comes to Excel and stuff, but it, it does feel quite nice to kind of count up the pennies coming in, um, every night and, yeah. and to be able to get a real feel of what your business is like. Yeah. I mean, there are two figures that are produced from equations on my, my spreadsheet, the report, and one is the percentage of ad spend uh, against revenue, which the spreadsheet helped me identify early on with Robert's series that was out of, not out of control, but was too high. It was 55%, sometimes 60%. And I know I knew that without growing the revenue, I could increase profits by just, re you know, getting that, that down to about a third. Um, and the other thing is the profits. That's, you know, so it doesn't really matter how much revenue you get from uh, KDP or anyone else if you're spending too much on ads. So you're right. And I did talk to um, to Philip actually about that, about having that spend in there. And I think that you know the, a lot of things will be added to these platforms over time. I know with I know with Publish Drives Abacus you can put in spend. I'm sure with Book Report as well. 
you can. It's very important to to look at those two together. Not a book report. It um, doesn't. It doesn't. No, it doesn't do spend. Okay. No, <clears throat> just uh, just income, and it only, it only does Amazon. So the the benefit of um, reader links and subscribe count is that it's it's a way to programmatically and in other words hands off um ingest data from all of the platforms that you're on um when i when i got started six or seven years ago there was a platform that enabled well, a little soft piece of software which I, the name i can't remember it now but it, it basically you take this, your spreadsheets you download the spreadsheets from all of the platforms you'd upload them and it would then interpret those and put them into a dashboard yeah it was quite good um not not brilliant so it, it's great that we've got People like ScribeCount now making it easier to see all of the data in a convenient, to, to kind of gather it conveniently and then present it in a way that enables you to see how your business is doing across all platforms. Yeah. It was an interesting interview. And Philippa did say it was annoying to them sometimes that, um, or, you know, a challenge to them. Every now and again, Amazon would change things and they would mm. have to reorder the program. And I thought, welcome to our world. Yeah, yeah. You that see that book report will go better. down occasionally. And um, I mean, the guy, yeah. uh, we've never spoken to him before, but he's a guy called Liam runs book report. And um, you see Amazon changes the a API um, and, and book report falls over. He fixes it really quickly, but you just go to keyboards and it's like, the world is falling because book report yeah, has yeah. fallen over. Um, and it's like, give the guy a break. He, he's, he fixed yes. it really, really quickly. Um, and yeah. Spike, I'm sure, will be just the same. Um, Randall yeah. and, and Philippa will, will, I mean, Randall is, is an author that I've, I've known for a little while. And, um, you know, he, he will, I'm sure, will get that fixed super quick. So patience is sometimes required for these things. I think we did speak to Liam from Book Report very early on in the podcast. I think mm, uh, maybe a long time ago. It's been going a long time. Yes. Like the book writing process, yes. things take a long time, like a good wine, <laughs> take a while to mature. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much indeed. It's a reminder that the 101 course, selfpublishingforum.com forward slash 101 is available until Wednesday. And if you want to check out the launches course, we've talked about launches today, uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash launches. That, my friend, is that. You've been playing a bit of golf. I developed a shank in the... Um, in the range and i was watching youtube videos last night terrible thing a shank terrible thing need to uh <laughs> and need to get rid of it yeah don't ever watch a video about it if you don't have it just pretend it doesn't exist james has been shanking so, again i have and on that bombshell uh <laughs> thank you very much indeed to our guests from scribe count and good luck to scribe count launching this week uh philippa werner and uh we will be here next friday until then, all that remains for me to say is this a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me and the terrible Shanker. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.